Okay, this is the Interpreting Current Proceedings 1 class. You should all have your course syllabus and also your manual for this class. My name is Nestor Wagner. I will be teaching this course. My email address is wagner at interpreting.com. Phone number is 800-625-6222. If you need to talk to me or set up some type of over-the-phone appointment, you can always do that. Usually you will be contacting Monica, who keeps my schedule and my agenda and lets you know what's available, okay? Now this class is the first course in a series of four courses that will prepare you to become a court interpreter. So as a matter of fact, the program is called Court Interpreter. And uh, the goal of this program, the main goal of this program is to make you a court interpreter, really. But from your point of view, the main goal of this program is to pass the state examination or federal examination to become a court interpreter. Um, this course, which is called Criminal One, it's 11 weeks long, and the goal of this course, so our goal is to Make sure, number one, that you learn legal vocabulary, specifically criminal vocabulary, with their corresponding translation. So you learn words and the corresponding translation of those words. That's one of the goals. Second goal of this course is to make sure that you become familiar with two interpreting techniques. And those techniques are consecutive and simultaneous. The third goal of this program is for you to become familiar with this uh, third goal of this course, rather become familiar with legal expressions and I'm going to go back to this in a second please don't and court proceedings by that I mean that you will become familiar with the terminology that is used in an arraignment terminology used in a pretrial hearing, in a preliminary hearing, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's our goal. We have 11 weeks to accomplish these goals, and uh, generally most people accomplish these goals, and I have a way to measure your progress. If you're an on-site student, you're here, the way that is measured is through quizzes that you take almost every week. If you're an online student, same way, quizzes that you will be able to take every week. Online students will be able to take the quiz for that week after listening or watching the lecture. And the lectures are divided into two parts for online students. Lecture whatever, like in this case number one before the break, and lecture number one after the break. The quiz is usually, usually takes place in the lecture after the break lecture one after the break or lecture two after the break. So those of you online will see that you have uh, a link, a button at the bottom that says clearly, you know, click here to take quiz number whatever, and then you can take the quiz. There, are, there, there will be a total of seven quizzes throughout the quarter. And for both programs, I make no distinction whatsoever. I will pick the best five grades. So it means you can have two grades that are really bad and still be okay. In other words, you still get 100% in the uh, quiz category. There is, of course, a midterm and a final exam. 
for those of you on site right here, the midterm is all written. There's no oral component. For those of you online, it's written, and then there is also an assessment called first assessment that includes, it's an over-the-phone assessment that includes an oral portion. That is basically an oral assessment. Last about 45 minutes or so. And the reason why we do that to online students is because we cannot hear while you're practicing in lecture one, two, three, and four. So what we do is we contact you in lecture five, or you basically have to set up the appointment. You'll be able to see that on the, uh, the, the scheduling of the program. And we call you, and uh, we'll give you a uh, we'll basically play some of the practices that we have played, and then we can hear you and give you some idea of how you're doing. On-site students, I can hear you every time you practice here, so I can also let you know uh, here uh, by the midterm or so. The final exam for this class is for on-site is part of it written, part of it is oral. When I say oral, I mean you need to interpret. The same thing is true for online students where they have to, where we call them final exam and second assessment. There, if you look at your course syllabus on the second page, it tells you, uh, my outline has a second email address, by the way, on top of the second page. Um, you can you see the one, the one I gave you on the board or the one that is there, doesn't make a difference. So there are five quizzes, 100 points each, one midterm, one final exam, and then we call class participations. A class participation really means that you are, for those of you on site, means that when I play a practice, you make an effort to interpret. Even though you probably make a lot of mistakes, it's irrelevant. I'll give you 100 points for just, or 200 for just making an effort to do that. For people who are online, class participation means that you are keeping the pace of the program. In other words, you're watching one lecture per week. If you watch a lecture after seven days from the previous lecture, you will not get any grades on class participation for that lecture. So we want to make sure that those of you who are out there online, and there are many of you, you watch lectures every week like the students who come here on site. Otherwise, you're going to be losing points. But for those of you on site, it's your participation in class. And obviously, if you're not in class, then I can't give you any grade. But there are only five class participations. So there will be a total of seven. I'll pick the best five. Mm -hmm. To pass this course, you need an 90% or, or um, excuse me, 70% uh, or better. and once you pass this course, you can move on to Criminal 2. Hmm? Books required, the book that you were given today or the book that, same book that you downloaded, the class manual, if you're an online student. And then there are two dictionaries you're going to need. One Spanish English, English Spanish, that is called a general dictionary that we don't sell it here. You can purchase it anywhere. Um, any, any bookstore that is still open because they are closing bookstores right and left nowadays. Uh, or order in Amazon.com or whatever. It's a dictionary that we suggest you use something like Larousse Dictionary. I'm going to show you so that you have an idea of the dimensions of the dictionary because sometimes you bring a very tiny one that is not going to work. So let me show you the dictionary. Give me a second, please. It should be at least this thick, all right, this thick. This is the one that I use. You can use LaRousse, you can use Oxford, you can use whichever you like, Spanish, English, English, Spanish. And it is a dictionary that has general terms, all right? That's, that's the first thing you want to purchase. The very first thing you want to purchase is this dictionary. Now, the next thing you're going to need is a criminal court dictionary, but you don't have to purchase it yet, after the midterm. 
week number six or so. And that dictionary, we do have it here because it was written by one of our instructors. So you can purchase it here. It's not expensive at all. And if you're online and you want to order, you can also order it uh, at the right time. And the name of the dictionary is also indicated on your course syllabus. I beg your pardon? The, the question is if the dictionary is available right now for criminal court. It might be available, yes. I'm not sure. Yes, it's possible. So that's, those are sort of the, the rules of the pro, I mean, let me, well, let's talk a, little, a few other rules. Uh, number one, we'll start class at, for you here, it's, well, online, you, whenever you want to watch it. But for you here, we start at 1130. We take a break. In words, that will be, let's say, for example, today, lecture one before the break will be from 11.30 to around 1 o'clock. Then we take a 25-minute break, and then we come back at 1.25, 1.27 sometimes. We have lecture one after the break, and it will be until 2.50. Usually, lecture one before the break, it's a little bit longer than lecture one after the break, or le any lecture number before is a little bit longer. It's about 10, 15 minutes longer, all right? Everybody here, and obviously the ones online, will have access to our online interpreting lab. And those of you here will also have access to watch up to three lectures that you miss. What I mean by three lectures is three days. So it's three, six lectures, because they are divided into before the break and after the break. That's the maximum number of times that you can watch a class uh, that you missed. Or sometimes you didn't miss the class, but you want to watch it anyway, that's fine. You also have the option for on-site students of coming to the weekday class if you cannot make it on a Saturday. And I understand there's no space, but there will always be space because people will be missing class. You know, So you can come to, I don't know what day of the week it is, you have to check in the main office for the class schedule. And then uh, you can come to that class. If you do that, you, when you take your quiz, you write your name and also write down on top my name, Wagner, so that the instructor there will put that quiz in my box there, and then it doesn't get lost. All right? If you do watch it online, you can take the quiz online as well after watching the lecture. So that will be another option. So you will have access to the videos, up to three lectures if you're here. Online students have way more access for it, obviously. And you will also have access to an online interpreting laboratory, which I will show you after the break, in lecture one after the break, how to access that and so on and so forth, okay? And what's the use of it? Everything is linked, is intertwined. What that means is that what we do here in class in a given lecture is linked to what you uh, uh, will be doing in the lab, and it's linked to the quiz that you're going to be taking the following week. Every week, you're going to be taking a quiz. I promise you that. Last but not least, in every class, with the exception of lecture number one, you're going to be practicing, because this is all about interpreting. It's all about uh, using the knowledge that you uh, acquired by reading the manual and, and, and doing your homework and also by being in, the, in, the cl in class, using it in such a way that you can interpret. Excuse me, I didn't hear Okay. Um, so usually you can, um, you can, you, in other words, you have to get all that knowledge and be able to use it because it's about court interpreting. All right, being able to interpret, not about having something in written form and having a lot of time to come up with the interpretation, or in this case, could be also translation. All right, so those are basically the rules. And then some final rules here is that please make sure you turn off your cell or put it in vibrating mode. I don't want to hear phones that are just beeping or, or people calling, all right, because one time I let it slide, the second I confiscate it. And I keep it for the duration of the class. We'll put it in the office. We'll remove the phone from the classroom. 
So we don't want to do that. But if you put it in a, you know, I know I understand that some of you may be getting some phone calls dealing with your children or whatever. That's okay if it's vibrating mode. I don't want you to be texting in my class because what happens often with all these new gadgets is that you start texting. Oh, it's very quick. Yeah, you text very quick, but you lose concentration on the class, and then you ask me the question that I just explained. And the rest of the students who are paying the same amount of money that you're paying will get less class time because of those questions. So I'm not allowing any text. And please, if I see somebody texting, I'm going to ask you to please leave the room. We have a room in the, somewhere in there called Discussion Lab. We have like 12 people there anxiously waiting to be here. So if I notice you text on a regular basis or your phone rings too often, I'll send you to that room and I'll bring somebody who is more interested in this class to this classroom. Because your actions affect the rest of the class, even the people that are taking it online. All right? So let's just have some rules so that things can happen. All right? So having said that, any questions on anything before I begin with the class? Yes, ma'am. Can you use an electronic dictionary for this? That's a good question. I don't have anything against electronic dictionaries, but here's what I don't like about electronic dictionaries. I will tell you, in fact, I'm telling you right now, when you have your dictionary, when you look up a word, I want you to highlight it. And I want you to highlight it so that if you in the future have to look up that word again and it is highlighted, it obviously didn't register. So you're going to do certain things, like create a flashcard with that word and the translation on the back. When you use electronic dictionaries, you cannot highlight anything. So that's the risk involved. But I have no problem using if you use electronic dictionaries. By the way, you should not bring your dictionaries to class. They're very heavy and there is no need to have them. The main purpose of a dictionary is to have it there when you're doing your online practices. Okay, not here. Here, don't worry. You can ask me. All right, that's not a problem. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. The quizzes. When are the quizzes taken? The quizzes will always take place at the end of the session, the last 10, 15 minutes. Quizzes for those of you who are online will be multiple choice. Quizzes who are on site will not be multiple choice. I will just dictate words and you have to give me the translation. And I give, there is a time limit for both, because remember, you, you have to click. I can you know, give you a quiz and give you enough time to think forever, because in interpreting, it's all about speed. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, one, the, how many lectures do you have every class? No, a class by definition is a lecture, right? And it is divided into two, before the break or after the break. So you, you will get lecture one today, before the break, for you it means up until one o'clock. And after the break, which for you it means from 125, 127 to 250. But for those of uh, people online, it's different. The reason why we have it like that is so that people online don't have to sit down for three hours in a row to watch the whole lecture. Sometimes it's not feasible. Any other questions? All right, let's start with this course. Everything I say is important in this course if you want to pass your state exam. So I know you will be taking notes and all that. I also allow people to bring a tape recorder and record my lectures. I have no problems with that. If you're an online student and you want to record what I'm saying so that you have access to it and take it whatever you want, you can do that. What you cannot record is the practice that is played in class. And the practice that is played in class has some type of identifying things. So if we find those tapes, we are able to know where it's coming from. So for those of you online or on site, on site means you with the headsets, you can be recording what comes from your headsets. And online, it means any time we have a practice, then you can do that, because that's copyrighted. You are not buying it. You are paying to use it. The material that I'm teaching you, you're buying it. So you can record as much as you want, all right? So uh, the first thing that I want to discuss with you is a very interesting concept. 
that usually people have difficulties with. And that concept is the, f the concept of transferring something from one language into the other and how the transfer should take place. The act of interpreting is the act of hearing something in a given language and transferring that into the opposite language. In this case, it's English and Spanish. The transfer is verbal, not written. That's interpreting. Anytime you transfer from one language into the other, into a different language, you will find that there are problems in the transfer that are linked directly to things such as grammar, dif grammatical differences, or word order, the placement of the words are different. There is a big difference between un hombre grande y un gran hombre, as I mentioned in the past. And then there is all, also this issue of transferring something that may sound similar in, the, in both languages, but they may, it may not convey the same meaning. She's embarrassed. Ella está embarazada. No, right? Está avergonzada. And of course, we have the other element that we, we only have here in the US, and that is the Spanglish portion of it. Hmm? Me fui, salí de la house porque me fui a la marqueta. Well, I don't know what, something like that that makes absolutely no sense. Obviously, mixing languages is something you are not to do in interpreting. Because you always, you should always remember that this is you and this is the person that you're, well, let's make it a woman, I guess. Sounds like, I don't know, a woman. This is the interpreter and this is the, let's say defendant. The defendant speaks Spanish. If you say a word in English to that defendant, she's not going to understand that. And she's going to say, que, and then you have to say, what? And then what she didn't understand is what you said, not what the judge said. Because the judge said, what is it that you didn't understand, ma'am? Que es lo que usted no entendió? Esa palabra en inglés, that word in English. And the judge says, wait a minute, the judge says, wait a minute, all the words I uh, that I have been using are in English. So it creates a lot of confusion. So you're not supposed to say anything in a language that the person that you're interpreting for will not understand. We call that mixing languages. That's not allowed. This person that you have there, I'm going to draw it in nicer, OK? Nice. Well, not too, too much nicer, but uh, this person who is the defendant It's very unique, like we all are. And it's unique in many ways, not only in his or her beliefs, but also in his or her knowledge of the language. When we interpret in a court of law, if we interpret for 30 different individuals, I can assure you that all 30 of them will have a different degree of comprehension of what I'm saying. Some will understand 80%. Some will understand 50%, some will understand 100%. That comprehension has to do a lot to do with their level of education. I'm going to say the same thing that the judge is saying in the opposite language, regardless of how difficult it is. But whether the person will comprehend it or not, it's something that is out of my control. So when you have a situation that in a given day you're interpreting for the 30 different individuals, and they all have different level of education, and furthermore, some of them come from different countries, you have a very difficult task. The code of ethics of the in, a court interpreter state, clearly states that you should never explain, but rather interpret. And that means that if a very complicated word is said by the judge, you have to use a complicated word in Spanish. It doesn't matter whether he or she, will, the defendant, will understand. It's irrelevant. But the area where we have some control is where the person is coming from. Because if this person comes from Mexico, then you have a set of words that you may use, including legal words and slang. But if this person comes from, so we have a set one. But if this person comes from Peru, then you may have a set two, a different type of words, because the slangs that 
are clearly understood in Mexico will not be understood in Peru or may even give you a completely different meaning. Hoy no tengo nada de lana. For somebody in Peru will be, I don't have any wool. For somebody in Mexico, it means I don't have any dough, any money. So those slangs are dependent on where you come from. Now, this, the state, you, you cannot, there's no way for you to know everything for every single country. So the state of California and most state nowadays, because they are all under the consortium exam, will require that you are familiar with slang and vocabulary used in Mexico and Central America. So be aware of it. So our assumption, when you go and take an exam, you don't see a person. You just hear a tape. And nobody tells you where that person comes from. So you have to make certain assumptions. And the first assumption you're going to make is that that person comes from Mexico and or Central America. And what I'm saying, the reason why I'm saying this is because if the person, if in real life, if I'm working in court and I know that a person comes from Mexico, I will be using even legal terms that are much more appropriate for Mexico. For example, instead of saying el fiscal, I will say el agente del Ministerio Público. We'll learn all that. Instead of saying la fiscalía, I will say el Ministerio Público. Instead of saying juez, I'll say el ciudadano juez. Instead of saying libertad condicional, I'll say condena condicional. All these variations in the legal area, in the specialized vocabulary, are necessary so that this person that comes from Mexico, who may not have a lot of education, but certainly heard or watched TV or heard the radio in Mexico, and that's the terms that they use, will comprehend it better. So in any, any state examination, you need to, we call that localize localized to a given country, in this case Mexico or Central America. So the principle of localization is when you have a message in a given language, you transfer into Spanish in this case, but localization is what tells tell you what country you're going to in terms of your language. So in the example we we're just giving you is Mexico. The state exam requires that the localization is Mexico and or Central America. They're very similar. So this brings up a very interesting point. Localization does not only exist on legal terms. It also exists in slangs. If you get the slang in English, like uh, he's pissed off because his uh, woman didn't show up, then instead of saying estaba muy enojado, estaba enojado porque su mujer no se presentó, you have to localize with the same register, the same uh, level of the language. And when you localize to Mexico, he's pissed off because his woman didn't show up, will probably be, está petateado de encabronamiento porque su ruca no se presentó. <laughs> That's localizing to Mexico, but now at a very lower register. It's important for you, of course, this expression, estaba petateado de encabronamiento porque no se presentó su ruca, you tell that to somebody in Peru and has no clue what you're talking about because you're localizing to Mexico as required by the state exam. The localization principle is also important in idiomatic expressions. When you hear things such as, and some of you already know this, but when you think such as it is raining cats and dogs, your temptation is to transfer that idiomatically. Llueve gatos y perros. Now you know that that doesn't make sense in Spanish. So that prevents you from doing that. But it doesn't make sense in this example because you're familiar with that, that expression. It makes no sense in Spanish, llueve gatos y perros. But sometimes the expression in English, you're not familiar with the expression in Spanish and you do interpret word for word and it makes no sense. For example, it's on everyone's lips. You may say, está en los labios de todos, which in Spanish is anda en boca de todos. Just an example like that. He's moving at a snail's pace. O se mueve a paso de caracol, when in Spanish is a paso de tortuga. 
this thing that I just did that we are going to be learning here, don't worry about it, learning all that stuff, it's called localization of an idiomatic expression. Idiomatic expressions, such as it's raining cats and dogs, he's moving at a snail space, has a localization that is universal. In other words, that expression is true in Mexico as well as in Spain. Everybody knows that, llueve a cántaros. You may not know it because you learn Spanish here in the United States in your, at home, and maybe your family members didn't use that expression. But if you had lived in Mexico or Spain, llueve a cántaros, or uh, uh, anda en boca de todos, is a very popular idiomatic expression. So localization is always important, mainly important in court interpreting, when the vocabulary is colloquialisms, slang in English. All right? And sometimes when the vocabulary is very specialized. So vocabulary, by the way, is divided into three areas. We call this low register vocabulary, general register, and high register. Here is where you find your legal vocabulary. Here is uh, what you use on a daily, daily basis. That's the general vocabulary. Table, microphone, book. And this is the slang, colloquialism, or foul language, or bad words. That's called law register. So localization is very heavy here, lots of pluses, just a little bit here. Because if I hear an expression in English that uses exp something like, I'm going to have a brewski tomorrow morning, instead of saying, me voy a tomar una cerveza, because cerveza is in this general register, see? General means that everybody, every country where Spanish is spoken will understand the word cerveza, will understand that term, and they do. So I'm going to have brewski tomorrow. If you say, voy a tomar una cerveza mañana, you're not respecting the register, we say. What you should say, if you localize to Mexico, is me voy a echar una chelita mañana por la mañana. And you even change the verb, echar una chelita, no tomar una chelita. So that you convey the message at that register. Why is that register important? Imagine you're interpreting for a witness who committed the crime of rape, uh, who, well, no, let's say for a defendant, you're interpreting for a defendant, let's say there is a defendant who committed the crime of rape, and the only witness is the victim, but the victim didn't see the defendant because she was completely drugged, doesn't know who the defendant is. So then there is another witness who only heard what was going on but couldn't see the parties. Maybe because it was in a park, whatever the circumstances are. The only way to identify this defendant is through what the defendant told the victim while committing the act. If the defendant used a lot of colloquial terms and a lot of slang at that time, that becomes evidence in court. So when the witness comes to testify and the attorney asks questions such as, can you tell us what you heard on such and such date? Or, oh, oí que él le decía, pinche vieja, ¿por qué estás haciendo esto? Or something like that. And then you transfer that, oh, you bad woman, why are you doing that? Instead of saying fucking bitch, then you, lo you change the register and you are helping the defendant. And the defendant may get off the hook because of your lack of interpretation, improper interpretation. So don't take this idea of colloquialisms as something very likely. No, it's very important. And it is, in fact, the most difficult things that we interpreters face on a daily basis. Because remember, people that we interpret for, they are individuals. They have individual characteristics. And we interpret for 30 different witnesses in a given day, for example. And not all of them come from Mexico. Maybe we, there's one from Colombia. And then that person uses slang from Colombia. And we may not know what it means. Because our training is 
to localize to Mexico and Central America. So what do you do in a case like this in a real situation? You ask the judge permission to ask this person, what exactly are you talking about? So when the person answers something that you don't know, and this is true for any term that you don't know, that you're not sure, all you have to say is, your honor, may the interpreter inquire. Your honor, may the interpreter, it's with an I or E inquire, with an E, right? I inquire, yeah. Your honor, may the interpreter inquire. This is sort of a, a code in the courtroom that basically what you're really, what the, what the judge gets from this code is the interpreter doesn't know what the hell she's saying and she needs to, he, the interpreter needs to know what's going on. So I, got, I have to give her the right to do that. So all judges will say, certainly Mr. Interpreter or Madam Interpreter. And then that gives you permission to start talking to the witness because you are not there to talk to the witness. So you turn to the witness and say, Señor, cuando usted utilizó la palabra petateado de encabronamiento, ¿qué quiere decir? Pues que estaba muy enojado. Okay, muchas gracias. Thank you, Your Honor. And then you have to say, I was very upset. Because if you didn't know petateado de encabronamiento in Mexico, in this, that slang, you most likely do not know the slang in English. So you pay a price by not keeping the register. But at least you convey the message. The same thing happens with, if you don't remember llueve a cántaros for it's raining cats and dogs, and you say llueve mucho, still okay in real life. In the court exam, it's still okay, but there is a minor deduction, minimum. If that point, if that key unit, they call it, if that word, that expression is worth at one point, and you, instead of saying llueve a cántaros, you, you say llueve mucho, then they will give you, instead of one point, they'll give you 0 0.95. So they give you most of it. Now, if you say llueve gatos y perros, they give you zero. Okay. Finally, before we get into the legal thing, we have this problem that uh, is very common that we call false cognates. And some of you may know what this means, some of you will not, may not. A cognate, by definition, is a set of words, one in English and one in Spanish, that sound very similar to each other, like embarrassed, embarazada, but that they don't mean the same thing. That's a false cognate. So a cognate, two words that sound similar. But when it's a false cognate, those words don't have the same meaning. Because embarrassed is avergonzada in todo caso. Embarazada is to be pregnant. False cognates, we use them a lot. You probably use them all the time. And we will correct them throughout the quarter. But the ones we're going to be dealing with today, well, they're not necessarily false cognates only, but the vocabulary that we're going to be discussing today, a page of legal terms, some of them will, you will be tempted to use a false cognate. For example, probation, probation, provecho. Don't they sound similar? Absolutely, but they don't mean anything. Provecho is when provecho. It has nothing to do with probation. Parole board, la tabla. What the hell is that? Even though they don't sound similar, now here the translation is word for word. It's not localized. La tabla de la parola. What the hell is that? No es la junta de la libertad preparatoria. That's because you are now making a mistake in localization, which is everything we have been talking about. Sometimes the cognate is fine. Robbery, robo. So the, what we are going to be discussing now and continue after the break is on page number two in your manual. And the title of it is called Key Criminal Terminology. The reason why I selected all those words there is because, and I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining it, it's because these words in any interpreting exam will not give you partial credit. You either know it or you don't know it. It's not like it's raining cats and dogs, llueve mucho, and you get 0 0.95 out of 1. Here, if you, you, if you don't know how to say evidence and you use the incorrect term, you get 0. So these words are 
they have so much weight in your exam that it's necessary for me to spend an hour on those. Shh, please quiet. What that means is that during this next hour, of course we're going to break it into before the break and after the break, you need to know the translation of these words and I will explain a few things associated with these words. But what, at the end of the day, all you need to know is the translation of the word. But sometimes I will explain certain things because that word may have more than one meaning. As a matter of fact, that's the reason why you have two dictionaries, one general, one legal. Because sometimes a word has a general meaning that is different to its um, legal meaning. For example, take the word consideration. Consideration is a word that if you look it up in a general vocabulary, will say consideración. But if consideration is used in a legal context, such as the consideration included in this contract, it's no longer consideración. It's contraprestación. But wait a minute, but the dictionary tells me that consideration is consideración. Yes, but what dictionary? The general one. Yeah, but the word consideration is used in a legal context here. So you should not look up consideration in the general vocabulary or general dictionary. You should look it up in the legal one. That's why you have two types of dictionary. Which one you use depends on context. If the expression is, he had no consideration towards me, then you wouldn't look it up in a regular dictionary, in a general, in a legal dictionary. You would look it up in a regular dictionary. So your job as an interpreter, in this case it could also be translator, is to determine which tool you have to use. You know, you have a hammer and a screwdriver. You know, you may be able to, with the screwdriver to hit a nail, but that's not the right tool. So you have these two dictionaries you have to use. You have to decide which one is the right one based on context. If you're going to work in court, obviously, when you, you know the terms already, when you transfer the terms into the opposite language, you have to decide, is this a legal translation or the non-legal translation? Because if the original is in a legal context, I have to use the legal translation. But if it is not, I have to use the non-legal translation. We're going to be learning that here. So these terms are very critical, and uh, some of you may know some of those, but only a few, because uh, after the fourth term, I can assure you, you don't know them. So let's start with the very first one. You can take notes on a separate piece of paper. You can use your manual, whatever you prefer. Let's look at the translation of the term court. I'm going to try to be brief on this one, but it's important. There are basically three translations, four translations that you need to know. I'm going to write them down here. Tribunal, Juzgado, Judicial, Juez. Oh, wait a minute. None of them include the word corte. That's because court and corte, from the legal definition of these terms, they may not be uh, they may not be good cognates. They may be incorrect. Why? Because corte in Spanish is defined as the building in which there are courtrooms where two or more judges in each of those courtrooms, two or more, decide a case. Where we go and interpret here in the U.S., we always interpret in what is known as trial court, meaning that there is going, the objective is to have a trial. And in trial court, there is going to be only one judge. So because it, for you to be able to use corte, you have to make sure that there are two judges deciding a case in Latin America. And here, one judge is the only one that you're going to see when, uh, when you go and interpret in court. You cannot use it anymore. So the question is, what do you use? Well, tribunal o juzgado. Tribunal, if court refers to courthouse. Is juzgado if court refers to courtroom. So, for example, Norwalk Superior Court will be Tribunal Superior de Norwalk. Santa Monica Superior Court, Tribunal Superior de Santa Monica. Los Angeles Superior Court, Tribunal Superior de Los Angeles. Why? Because when you're talking about a name of a place, you're referring to the courthouse. 
courtroom is if you're really talking about a courtroom in that courthouse. Like, for example, I work in court. In, in court. As an interpreter, it will be more appropriate for me to interpret that as trabajo en el juzgado, because that's where I interpret. I don't interpret in the building, in the whole courthouse. I don't interpret in the, in the, uh, um, uh, you know, in the waiting area. Um, so it's important that you look at context, because this is all about conveying uh, message. And the message is highly dependent on the context, on what it's referring to. Judicial is used only when you have a situation where you have the word court and then something else, like court interpreter. Interprete judicial. Court order. Orden judicial. It's different than I'm going to court tomorrow. The tomorrow is not a noun, it's not an object. Right? So you'll say, voy al tribunal mañana, voy al juzgado mañana. Both will be correct because I really don't know where, which one you're referring. I don't have enough context. But if I say, I, I'm going to superior court tomorrow, then it will be, voy al tribunal superior mañana, because I'm already specifying a location, a courthouse. But if I say he is a court interpreter, you see the word interpreter now is more like a noun. So in that case, court modifies it, and the translation is interprete judicial. A court document, un documento judicial. What would be court decision? Decision. Judicial. Juez is used only when you see the before the word court. You have to have the or this. So if you see the court, es el juez. This court, este juez. No esta corte, no este tribunal, no este juzgado. Questions on court. Never corte. Criminal is a term that translates into Spanish. I'm going to do, I'm going to basically give you three, three translations only. First one, delincuente. Second translation for criminal, penal. Third translation for uh, okay, for criminal. I give you this one. Just for this word, criminal act. Acción dolosa. Just for that word. Take this as one expression, and this is the equivalent expression. But at no time I use the word criminal, although the word criminal exists in Spanish. The reason why I didn't use it is because criminal in Spanish can only be used if the person who committed that crime committed a very serious crime. And sometimes it may be appropriate to use it, but sometimes if you don't have enough context, you don't know. Because if you're taking the exam and the very first line is the criminal appear in court, and you have no more idea, they ask you to interpret at the same time, and you have no idea whether this, what crime he committed, then you say el criminal, and then you commit it already to a situation that may not be the real one. Because when you say criminal, you're already assigning, or you're already stating that this person committed a very serious crime. So we want a term that works at all time, and that term is delincuente. So it's el delincuente. You can spell it with C or Q. And then, of course, criminal act is acción dolosa. La palabra dolosa viene de la palabra dolo, que quiere decir de mala fe, que básicamente quiere decir que uno hace una acción sabiendo que va a ocasionar un daño a un tercero, con mala intención. Only for these two. So when you see criminal act, acción dolosa. No acción criminal, acción dolosa. Only for that word. And finally, penal. Penal is the term that refers to subject matter. There's a difference between a criminal judge and a civil judge. They work in different places and they deal with different cases. They are both judges, but criminal here is denoting subject matter, knowledge in a certain subject matter. So criminal will be penal and civil will be civil. For example, criminal code will be what? Codigo, civil, uh, codigo penal. 
And criminal judge will be juez penal o en lo penal. Sometimes they put something in between, but juez penal is good enough. So criminal also means penal, and it refers to subject matter. Any questions on this one? Case is, of course, the same thing is true for crime. If you see the word crime, it will be delito, the word that we like you to use for crime, all right? No crimen. Even though it's not here, crime, it better translates into Spanish as delito. No crimen, please. Because you can only use crimen if the crime is very serious. But when you say delito, it really doesn't take into account whether the crime is, was serious or not. Case is a term that you can use two translations for it. Caso o causa. They are both correct translations. My advice is that you use this one, because the diff which is causa. The difference between these two is that causa is used when, you, when it is it's way more formal. What does that mean? It means that you, whenever they, you hear the word case and the judge is present, it should be causa or you're on the record, another way to say it is that. But if you're in lockup, you don't have to. In the cells, you can say caso, because the judge is not present there. Evidence, there's only one term that you can use, pruebas. And, oh my god, I, I, didn't, I don't see evidencia. Of course not, because evidencia does not work here. For you to use the, wor the word evidencia in Spanish, you have to must, you must be certain, you must be certain that there is no room for doubt that that indeed occurred. And the only way you can do that is if you were a witness. And jurors usually are not witnesses of crimes, or if they are, they are not gonna be jurors. So in a case where I present a lot of evidence to the jury, the jury, or the, each individual juror, did not, was not present at the scene of the crime. And therefore, that evidence cannot be called evidencia. Because for that juror, there, there is room for doubt. Maybe he's lying, whoever wrote this document. So that's why we always use pruebas for evidence. Always, please. Then comes the term probation. And next to it comes the word parole. We're going to look at that term probation, and the term parole. Let's say, for example, that I commit a crime. And this is my first crime that I committed. It's not very serious. And, or even if it is serious, but it is not something like murder or rape or anything like that. Let's say that it is petty, well, petty, petty theft. Um, Let's, let's pay theft if you don't, you don't spend too much time in jail anyway. But let's say that it is domestic violence. I hit the person that I live with. And I really didn't hit her. I just basically pushed her and she fell down. So there was not too much, there's not really a criminal act per se. The intent was, was bad, but it's different than if I go with a baseball bat and try to kill her. That would be attempted murder and with the use of a deadly weapon. That's much more complex. So, you know, the, the judge looks at, I, I am found guilty, and the judge looks at the number of months that I should be in county jail and looks at a code that gives the judge some guidelines as to how long I should be in county jail, and the code says the minimum is one month for anybody who committed that crime, and the maximum is six months. So the judge has the ability to pick anything between one and six. It's not that the judge months. The judge picks anything. The judge will pick the punishment according to the crime. Because one thing is if I push her, a different thing is if I hit her, and a different thing if, if I went with a knife, tried to attack and even even stab stab her with a knife. So there are there are still domestic violence incidents, but one is more serious than the other, so it carries a har harsher punishment. But let's say this is not a big thing, and you know, technically I should serve up to six months in county jail. But the judge looks at me and said, you know what, this is the first time you committed this crime. It wasn't too bad. I mean, it's bad, but it wasn't that bad. It could have been way worse. I'm going to give you the minimum. 
one month, although you really deserve like two and a half, three, but I'm going to give you the minimum. But I'm going to put you on probation for two years which really means that instead of me serving three and a half months in jail, for example, I serve the minimum because that's required by law, one month, and I am on probation for two or three years. What it means by probation is that all I have to do is obey all laws, really, and maybe don't hit her again, maybe don't come close to her if she doesn't want to be with me. There might be some conditions attached to it. But the main thing is that I obey all laws and all those conditions. So now, if I am on probation for, I obviously like that deal because all I want is to spend the minimum amount of time in jail. So I'll take the one month and I'll take the two year probation. So one month nowadays in county jail, you'll probably be out in six, seven days. So I'm out. Oh, that's great. No big deal. But I'm on probation for two years. A year later, I drive under the influence of alcohol, and they stop me, and they arrest me. Did I obey all laws? So I violated my probation, which we're going to learn that later on. And now this judge that gave me one month in my domestic violence case will get a shot at me again, because they're going to take me back to that courtroom if they found me guilty of thriving under the influence. And the judge is going to say, remember a year ago, I told you you should be three and a half months in county jail, but I decided to give you one month and put you on probation? Oh, yes, Your Honor. And do you remember that I told you that you have to obey all laws? Yes, yes, Your Honor. But you didn't, right? Because a year later, you drove under the influence of alcohol. Well, no, I didn't. All right, so now I have the right to give you up to the maximum time for this crime, which is six months and some judges will decide to do that or some judges will not but the judge technically can give me it's called to max me out we're going to see that expression in the future so the judge will then have the right to give me I serve one month and then I want to give him the maximum six so he has I have uh, the judge will say you have to serve five more months now this idea of probation is to give me another chance and while I am on probation, am I free or am I in, in, in jail? Free. free. So the translation for probation is libertad. Pero qué tipo de libertad? A prueba. Because I'm being te tried, you know, tested, so to speak. Well, that, I don't like that. That doesn't sound that technical. Okay, there's another word you can use. Libertad condicional. Why conditional? Because my freedom is subject to conditions. One of them is obey all laws. That's the idea of probation. By the way, probation is always associated with county jail and very often associated with misdemeanors. We'll learn that as well. But that's the concept of probation, and both of them are correct. In Mexico, however, this is known as condena condicional. Only in Mexico. So if I tell you, can you please localize the term probation to Mexico, the translation will be what? Condena condicional. But if I tell you, you know, can you translate probation without me telling you to what country, you can use whichever you like. But if I tell you, can you localize it uh, you know, to Mexico, then you have to give me the translation, the term that is used in Mexico. Now, parole, on the other hand, is different than probation because if you analyze what I just explained to you, probation is given to me so that I serve fewer months in jail. So it's always given to me in lieu of jail time, in exchange for jail time. Instead of going three and a half months, I go only one month, but I get probation. But if you want, you can go three and a half months and you don't get probation. That means that for the next two years, you don't have to worry. You can kill somebody if you want to, you know, whatever you want. Of course, you will be charged for that crime. Huh? <clears throat> so probation is always so that I serve less time. I don't go to jail. Parole, on the other hand, and by the way, probation is given to you before you start serving time. So the judge tells me one month and probation, and then I serve the one month. Sometimes you're serving in concurrently because you don't have money to pay a bail and all this stuff and you're stuck there, right? But technically, 
you, it's given to you before. Parole, on the other hand, is really associated with state prison, very serious crimes, felonies, rape, attempted murder, uh, very serious drug-related charges, uh, manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, all these very serious charges. And the way it works is that when my case is, uh, when I'm found guilty of a serious charge, uh, let's say attempted murder, the punishment, let's say, is 12 years. So I go 12 years to state prison, and it's going to be 12 years. The credit is minimum, if any, in state prison. There's a lot of credit in jail because it's overpopulated, but in state prison, no, not that much. But the law says that after I serve a certain period of those 12 years, maybe 75%, let's say after eight years, I can request to be released. And the grounds behind that is that I tell that this entity that I'm going to see to re make that request in state prison, and basically my grounds are, look, I've been here for eight years. It's going to take me at least two, three years to get back to the society. So in a way, I'm out, but I'm still being punished because I'm going to have a hard time out there. If you keep me here 12 years, when I'm released, it's going to take me another three, four years to find a job and, and, and get back to the society. So really, the punishment is 15 years. So parole is something that you request so that you can be released to prepare you to go back to the society. And that's why parole translates as libertad preparatoria. Libertad preparatoria. And it's given to me after I serve a period of time, a percentage of it. And it's, and, and it's different than probation because probation is given to me before I even start serving time. Question on any of these two. You need to know the translation. Yes, ma'am. So probation is condena Probation is condena condicional in Mexico. You can also use libertad condicional or libertad a prueba. And parole is just one, it's liber, eh, libertad preparatoria. And it is also used in Mexico as a very technical word, yes. Probation is always associated, yes, to almost always to misdemeanors, delitos menores. Got to be careful with this because sometimes, just briefly, briefly, you don't have to un actually understand this that much right now, but the maximum punishment for a misdemeanor is 12 months or 365 days. The minimum punishment for a felony is 365 days. So if I am convicted of a felony and they give me the minimum 365 days, can I request the judge to do that in county jail? If you have a good attorney, you bet you will. And then once I can clear that hurdle, I know that I'm going to be given a lot of credit. So out of the three, 12 months, I'll probably serve only three months. And the judge or the, the DA will say, yeah, you know what? You can serve it in county jail, but you have to be on probation. It's called felony probation. You're going to learn that. We're going to learn that. So don't worry about it. Yes, ma'am. You can use condena condicional for probation. There's absolutely nothing wrong here. It's the most, yeah, you can use it. But the problem with this is that in real life, if you say libertad a prueba, people understand you better. So remember, you have to keep the register. But if you have these three options and you can use one that people will understand better, use that one. Well, there's a comment from the student that really has to do about something that she knows that doesn't really pertain to the class, but whether you can combine it. No, when, the, when a person is there for the weekend, spends time in jail for the weekend, and is released on 
the week, uh, I mean, uh, during the weekday, and then release on weekend, is that what it was? That's called furlough. That's something completely different. It has nothing to do with probation or parole, and it is not a, con it might be a condition of a probation, but you have to request that to the county. And it is a minor, so that's different. Minors have different rules. We have to be very careful with that. Okay, let's move on now. We'll do about three, four more terms or five terms, and then we'll take our break. Assault. Well, it, I should really have, I'm going to do this, let's see, do we have it here? I'm going to, even though it's not there, I'm going to put this, I'm going to put all these three together. We have in the book only the word assault, but I'm going to add battery and assault and battery. First of all, there is a word in Spanish that sounds awfully similar to assault, which is asalto. So should I use it? What's assault in English, generally? To try to? Well, you can, well, it could be verbal or it could be physical. An assault could be of different types. But what is assault in Spanish? When you go with weapons and rob a place, asaltaron el banco. It doesn't mean that the, the robbers, or excuse me, the people that went to the bank were trying to be you know, to push the bank or anything like that. No, it means that they went with weapons. So they are false cognates. Hmm? So assault always translates into Spanish as agresión. Puede ser física o verbal. Now, battery is now different because battery, you have to have physical contact. So, for example, I go to to this gentleman here and I start assaulting him by saying, you know, threatening him and assaulting him in various ways. And then I push him. Immediately when I did that, it turned from assault to battery. So battery is agresión física. And then in, if on top of that, this gentleman, after I push him, injure himself, then the charge is assault and battery together. Que es agresión con lesiones. Yeah, if you, if you touch the individual, just the mere touching makes that a battery. So that's agresión física. But if I push him, for example, which is already battery, and he injure himself because of what? Of the, of, of the fact, because of the fact that I push him, then it becomes assault and battery. It's just one crime. And it is known in Spanish as agresión con lesiones. Robbery. That one, finally, we had one easy one. Robo. Thank God we got a good cognate here. <clears throat> you have to keep in mind, however, that armed robbery it's assalto. You don't have to say a mano armada. It's already implied. You could also say robo a mano armada. There is, of course, something we need to talk. And then after we discuss this, we'll take our break, OK? I know that you are probably tired already. Robo a mano armada. Mano armada, yes. You know, in Latin America, we care, we have crimes such as robo, asalto, hurto, y escalamiento. We're going to learn all those today. So remember that uh, 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 there are many crimes that are associated with taking property from someone else. And there are four. It could be robo. I will, I, you will see them in context, so you don't have to write them. But it could be robo, asalto, or robo a mano armada, hurto, y escalamiento. In English, you have many more. You have robbery, armed robbery, petty theft, grand theft, larceny, car theft, burglary, seven. 
So we have to match seven in English to four in Spanish. That obviously means that many of these one in English will have the same translation in Spanish. Now, it is important for us to understand the difference between, uh, okay, here we go, the difference between theft, robbery, burglary, let's just skip those three. You should, I should also put here armed robbery. If I take something from you, but you are not threatened or you are not present when I took that from you, and from you means from you as a person or it could be from you as being the owner of a store, we call that theft. Theft means you took something from someone else, but the, that someone else was not, didn't feel threatened or his or her life was not at risk. And in Spanish, we call that hurto. I think theft is right below robbery. In the US, it makes a big difference whether you, the theft is of an item that is worth $10,000 or an item that is worth $10. And theft is almost always associated with shoplifting almost always. So if I go to Best Buy during regular business hours and I take something that is worth it, $2,000, that's theft. Or if I take something that is worth it, $1, it's theft. But they are going to be classified differently. One that is worth it more than I think is $600 or something, I'm not sure about, don't quote me on that, it's called grand theft. The other one is petty theft, the one that it is below a certain amount of money that it always changes anyway. So grand theft is urto mayor, petty theft is urto menor. Grand theft, this is a felony. Felony means way more serious crime. This is not a felony. This is a misdemeanor. Oh, misdemeanor. Misdemeanor. Don't worry about these terms. We will learn them. But I just want to tell you that this one is not that bad, petty theft. But grand theft is bad. I can commit a crime of petty theft and be given only two days in county jail and be on probation for two years. And one of my conditions is that I do not commit, first of all, I don't go to that store and that I don't, I obey all laws, and most important of all, that I don't commit the crime of petty theft again during the two years. Because if I do commit it again, because of my background, because of my priors, that petty theft, the second time, will be treated as a felony, as a grand theft. Because I was given a chance. Now, if I, so if I go to, let's say that this gentleman has a store. He's the owner of Best Buy here in this location, wherever we are. Okay, so I go to his store and I take a, a radio or something and I don't pay for it. We, everybody calls that shoplifting, which by the way, shoplifting, if you want to know the meaning of it, or the translation is ratería en tiendas. Viene de la palabra, eres un ratero, have you heard that? So it's ratería en tiendas. But it is not, a cr the crime is not going to be called shoplifting. In other words, the judge is not going to say you're charged with the crime of shoplifting. No. The crime will be petty theft if it's below a certain amount of money or grand theft if it is above that amount of money. So if he's the owner of that Best Buy and I go there and I take something that is worth the $10 a radio, the charge will be petty theft. Did he know that I took something from the store? Not really. Was he threatened in any way? Not really. Was his life at risk when I took that from the store? Not really. Okay. Now, another case. He's still the owner of that Best Buy. He's outside in the parking lot. He has a very nice watch. I want it. So I go there and I say, give me that watch or I'm going to pull out a gun and kick your ass and kill you right here. 
Was he threatened? Yes. So he gives me the watch because he was threatened. That's called robbery, robo. Next scenario. He's also the owner of the Best Buy store. He walks into the parking lot with a very nice watch, and I want it. But I go there with the gun and point the gun at him. Give me the watch or I kill you. My God, that's way more intimidating, and there's always the risk that the gun fire by itself and kills me, or maybe that I, dis I mean, kills him, or maybe that I decide to kill him. I don't know. That's called armed robbery. Asalto or robo a mano armada. Way more serious, right? Fourth scenario. He's the owner of the Best Buy store. The Best Buy store opens from 9 a.m. until 10 p.m. At 1 a.m., I go to the store, and I have a key, and I get in, and I go inside, and I take this, the same $10 radio. The crime now is not theft, it's not robbery because there was nobody there, it's burglary. Because burglary is defined as entering into somebody else's business or property with the intent to commit a felony, which generally the felony is to take that, uh, you know, something from inside the store. Burglary which you have that if you go down the list is somewhere in there, I don't know how many words, but it's child abuse, molestation, violation, section, arraignment, arrest, bur bur burglary, you see burglary? Burglary translates into Spanish in a very unique way because it still keeps that crime still the same uh, terms that we use many, many years ago when this crime was considered a crime in Spain. And this was created by the kings and queens that had castles, and it was, it was, it was the push for this crime to protect their belongings from people to get into their castle and taking things. And at that time, the only way that you could get into a castle is by what? Escalando y metiéndose por arriba. From that term comes the translation of the term burglary, which is escalamiento. Now, I warn you that burglary in English is also used as a verb to burglarize. And it cannot be used escalar, for Christ's sake. To burglarize is robar. And for burglar, from burglary or to bur from burglarize comes the word burglar. Que no es el escalador, es el ladrón. Like thief. But the difference between thief and burglar is that the thief committed theft and the burglar committed burglary so when you see a burglar you always see somebody you know trying to get into somebody else's property like on the on the roof or something like that a thief is somebody who commits the crime of theft and you don't have to be on top of the roof for that you can go to a store and take something and you're a thief but a burglar which thief also means ladron in Spanish no difference but a burglar is somebody who committed burglary. So here's the question. If you see in Spanish the word ladron, and somebody asks you, how do you translate that into English? What's the translation, theft or burglar? It depends on the context. If the crime was burglary, I mean, si el delito fue escalamiento, what's the translation for ladron? Burglar. Pero si el delito es hurto, what's the translation for ladron? Thief. Yeah, thief, the ladron will be thief, right? Last word, and then we'll take a break. And that's the word next to bur below burglary, okay? And then I know there are some in there in between, and then we'll talk about them when we come back from the break. And that word is breaking and entering. Uh, let's do two, breaking and entering and trespassing. And trespassing. Let's say that now I decide to take something from your home, not from a store. It could be from a store too, it doesn't make any difference. But let's just for this example, I want to take something from your home. And you have a house and you have a yard. If I walk into your yard with the intent to commit a crime, that's very important because you have to show intent, that is known as 
trespassing. In Spanish, we call that acceso ilícito. Ilícito quiere decir ilegal. So if I walk, if I pass, if I go through your yard, that's called trespassing, acceso ilícito o acceso ilegal. If I keep walking, obviously I have some, you know, my intentions are not very good. So I keep walking and I look at the door and I realize that the door, it could be open or closed, I don't, it doesn't matter, but let's say I have a key or the door is open and I set foot into your property with the intent to commit a crime, that's the key, huh? then the crime that I committed is breaking and entering. I didn't break anything. Huh? In Spanish, we call that very awkward term, allanamiento de morada. Now, la palabra morada quiere decir vivienda, donde vive alguien. So the assumption for this translation is that the, the breaking and entering is of a dwelling, of a house. Because if the breaking and entering, so this is for a house. If the breaking and entering is in a store like the 7-Eleven, it will be allanamiento de un local comercial. That's for a store. So if I commit breaking and entering and the victim is the, I mean, if I commit breaking and entering in a, in a 7-Eleven store that is, well, 7-Eleven is 24 hours open, but let's say in, uh, in uh, Best Buy, that's called alienamiento de un local comercial. But if I commit this crime, breaking and entering in your home, eso es alienamiento de morada. Is that clear? Okay. No, 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 don't talk about lock, breaking the lock. We're going to get into that in a second. What about if I get to your house and it is locked and I use a crowbar? You know what, what is a crowbar? You know the translation for crowbar? Palanca. Let's say that I use a crowbar to break the lock. Now there is something else added to it, and that's called force entry. Hmm? In uh, acceso for, forzado o forzoso. We're going to learn that. We're going to learn that. You can add a lot of things to it. You know, the more things you do that are illegal, the more crimes you commit. If I want to, and then of course, once I walk into your house and I take the TV set, then I committed a, uh, a burglary. So if I want to go and take your TV set that I like so much, how many crimes do I actually commit? Well, first trespassing, then breaking and entering. And let's say I don't, I don't force my way in. So I don't know, I have a key or I use the window or whatever, I break a window. So trespassing first, breaking and entering, and burglary. Which one is the most serious one? Burglary, followed by breaking and entering, followed by trespassing. So when the judge tells me the crimes that I committed, he's going to, or she's going to put this into what they are known as counts. Count one will be the most serious one, burglary. Count two will be the, the one follow, breaking and entering. And count three will be trespassing. Keep that in mind because today we're gonna to talk about arraignment and most arraignments are divided into, crimes are divided into counts. In real life, they use these counts, the DA, the, the prosecution use these counts to negotiate the case because they drop many of these counts, but they always keep one at least. But that's something we're going to learn later. Any questions before we take a break? Yes. With regards to the word agreement, is it okay to use a legal or a serious crime? Or should we always the, the question is if you can use delito for a serious crime. Delito does not in any way or manner denote the seriousness of a crime. All it says is that you violated the law. So it's, you can use it at all times. Yes, ma'am. Force entry is acceso forzoso. I think it's forzoso. Yeah. Okay, so this ends lecture one before the break. Take it 20, let's come back at 140. One, yeah, 140. Let's come back at 140. You need to turn in, make sure you sign all your contracts and put all your